having just problems with the YouTube app today. Uh, Mark Wildman of Wildman Athletica, attempt number three at starting our live stream for the day. Start it one more time. For anybody who saw the first two beginnings, you're gonna hear this again. Um, we're starting by talking about our seminar that's in Bellingham, Washington, coming up at the end of July at the Flow Shala. Uh, we will be teaching, oh, big tractor coming by. Uh, we'll be teaching staff, mace, and club in that order. Staff is taught is OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, where we don't name specific movements or tell people what's coming. We simply build in uh, attack drills. One person can only attack and they can attack only one target. The other person can only defend. Uh, and you're not allowed to move your feet in the beginning. So we reduce the number of variables down to the smallest number of things that we can without telling people what to expect. So that people can start to learn to identify which hand is high, what's coming in. People start to see how the human body moves and they will start to start learning to apply all the athletic skills that they have from kettlebells, clubbing, and macing to an actual base human movement skill, which is defense and con conversely attack. You cannot learn the defense without learning the attack. Um, and then that builds up in complexity over time. Then we have mace, which moves slower than staff, but has basic stepping patterns and more advanced postures than you can do with something heavier. And then we go to club, the simplest one that is the slowest with your feet pointed straight ahead with no stepping patterns, but working on that heavy weight. So all three things are taught together as one idea, staff, mace, and club, and it's one idea. Infinite complexity, limited complexity, even more limited complexity. Um, so that's gonna be a super fun idea, and I would encourage people to do something like that because it will, sorry, our reset here, gotta get everything back in line. Our reset, um, sorry. Uh, teaching things in that order gets us into understanding why certain steps are there and why we do the movements that we do. I can tell people all day what base human movement patterns are, but until you experimentally understand it yourself, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, you can memorize facts all day, which is how it's kind of taught in engineering school now. People tend not to tell people how to say determine how hard gravity is pulling uh, or the force of gravity. But if you make everybody experimentally determine gravity for themselves and everybody in the room comes up with 9.81 meters per second squared, then everybody knows it forever. So instead of just telling people what the base human movement patterns are, we want people to discover the base human movement patterns over and over and over again by doing an experiment so you can build up your fundamental understanding of what you need to be working on in series. It's, a, it's how people should learn, but it's not how anything is taught anymore, which I think is horrible. I think everybody should be taught this way. Let me try and adjust this up just a little bit. Yeah, I don't have my good gimbal out here today. Um, so experimentally determining what movements you need to focus on first is very important. You need to focus on hip snap, you need to focus on overhead press, you need to focus on 360, shield cast, inside circle, outside circle, because they're the basis of everything else. And if I just have people repeat this, the experiment, everybody will eventually come to the exact same conclusion, which is the point. Everybody comes to the exact same conclusion. No matter what I tell people, everybody comes to the exact same idea. All right. Uh, yes, technical difficulties are resolved. Hello from Singapore. Wow, I don't know how far off is Singapore time-wise. I'm not sure about that one. And the Netherlands. I think that they are plus five from me. I think it's uh, five something p.m. there, or is, or is it now or off of London? Can't remember. Can't remember. Hi from the UK. UK. You guys have much better internet signal than we do, but America is like 50 times bigger. So where I'm at in the Midwest is the size of the UK and has the same population as the UK. Just don't have as many cool buildings as you guys do. What's the difference between Mace 360s, Halos, or Hydro Core Swings? Uh, question from John Doe, 12.14 p.m. Uh, halos. Halos are done with kettlebells. 
Kettlebells are a short lever and a heavier weight. Kettlebells, I believe, were first taught, as I understand it, by Steve Maxwell in RKC way back when, but it was an adaptation of a club two-handed shield cast. Think shield cast, top hand goes past opposite ear. Once you take away the top hand by making two hands symmetrical, you it doesn't matter which hand goes which way now. So you can do one direction, and then you can do the other direction, and then you can do alternating, and then you can start adding it up. But it all comes from the same idea. Um, what was the rest of that question? Halos and hydrocore. So halos and mace 360s, the difference is the length of the lever. So with a halo, you can use heavier weight. You can do it with a 70 pounder. If you try to do 70 pound mace 360s, you better be ungodly levels of strong because the length of that lever is gonna create more torque and it's gonna to try and rip your body in half. Uh, the hydro core, there's no balance point. Same type of movement, but it becomes more of a flat circle instead of around your head. You can do around your head, but because there's no handle, you have to do it in something like a mill or a reverse mill. Um, so the things that you're always concerned with is we're always trying to build circles with every implement that we can come up with. The basic implements that are the easiest to get your hands on are kettlebells, are the easiest because you can get them at Walmart now. Not great ones, but they're actually not bad now. 10 years ago, they were absolutely terrible. Now they're not bad. Every time I go to Walmart, I swing through there for something. I pick them up, I play with them just for fun. Um, then club. Club is a shorter lever, so you can have an intermediate weight and you're less likely to clock yourself in the back or the butt or the back of the thigh or the knee. And then mace. The steel maces that people have now, steel maces, are a little bit shorter than the old ones from scientific wrestling, I think. Um, and then you can have super long handled mace. The difference in all of those things is the length of the lever. The longer the lever, the lighter the weight you can use. So kettlebell, really what, 14 inches maybe lever total, but your hand's here. So however big the globe is, I can't remember, nine, 10 inches, maybe. Gotta be bigger than that, maybe 10 inches. Um, and then the club, intermediate lever, and then mace. So they are fundamentally very much the same. And that's what we want. We want you to learn to do that movement with all the implements. Because when you push and pull for the catch, changes slightly based on the length of the lever. So the more implements you use, the better you get at controlling that movement, the better you get at applying it to other types of athletic movement or to work patterns like swinging sledgehammers or swinging axes or doing sword work or something like that. Halos are uncontrolled. There's no stop, right? There's no lever. There's no balance point. So you have to keep it moving. So think about the pace of hydrocore being different than everything else. Everything else you can do slower. Uh, I compare it the difference between, say, the pace of rowing versus the pace of a ski erg. If you're familiar with concept two rowers, you have a very specific pace, right? 32 is super fast. 28, 24 to 28 is kind of where most people are pulling, but people can pull all the way down to like 20. Of course, there you can do it however you want. But ski erg pulls way faster than that. You're pulling at 38 to 42 usually, if I remember that right. 38, 38 to 42. But so think hydro core moves way, way faster because there's no balance point. Um, the other ones you could do on a metronome, you could do hydro core on a metronome. It would just be a fast metronome. Um, I can't remember what the rate per minute is for hydro core mills off the top of my head, but it's fast. Uh, for like mace 360s, your pace is supposed to be like 30 to 32 for heavier weights. That's how I do it anyway. Um, the competition guys are running at 36, which I think is insanely fast and doesn't have make great fixation. But what do I know? Um, mills are about in that same range as well. Mills can be a little bit faster than that. You can push. No, are they faster or are they slower? You should be pushing 14 to 18 per 30 seconds. So yeah, they're in the same range. Um, good question. Uh, the difference is the length of the lever. Uh, Paul Mason, heavy light. When utilizing added complexity instead of adding weight to your heavy day, how do you calculate your work capacity? You do a new work capacity. Every time you add complexity, you start a new tracking system. 
Um, so in the beginning, the way that like I write programs, level one, level two, level three, level one work capacity is not, uh, it's not apples to apples for level three work capacity. And if you add more complexity, you're creating new levels and they have their own defined work capacity. Um, and then your simple movement actually becomes your heavy day and your high complexity will end up being your light day. Uh, so they kind of flip. Um, but yeah, it's, you have to define it by that workout. And anytime you change that workout, the work capacity is no longer useful for understanding something else. Um, so this is something that happens a lot with kettlebell training. I focus very heavily on pure math for like swings, clean and press, snatches, deck squats, because those are your basics. We're treating it like barbell. We're treating it like barbell, where we're tracking our numbers for barbell. In barbell, you would track your three rep max, your one rep max, your five rep max, because those would allow you to predict other things. We're doing the same thing, but we can't do that because we don't have heavy enough weights. We have to do it by work capacity in order for it to be meaningful and useful, but I limit it to those things. The problem with a lot of kettlebelling, like Metcon kettlebelling, is there's no way to compare because if it changes every day, you, you, it's useless. You can't compare it back and forth between the two things anymore. So you still have to have some workouts in your week that define your overall absolute strength, like your clean and press, like your swing, like your Turkish get up, like your mill squat program work capacity. And then you could have Metcon work capacities in there that are there just to kick your ass, but it's very, very hard to track the progress with something like that. Um, unless you're defining a work capacity specifically for something like the armor building complex, which is easy to track because it's not changing. Once it stops being two cleans, one press and three squats, it's no longer the armor building complex from Dan John. It changes to something else and it gets its own work capacity number. So you have to keep your benchmark ideas like uh, the big three in barbell, your deadlift, your squat and your floor press. And then in Olympic lifting, you have your big numbers there. You have to keep those things constant. And then if you're outside of that, because you have to add complexity, then it's outside of that. It's like doing a woad in CrossFit where you can track your progress for each individual woad, uh, hero workout or something like that, like uh, your time for Murph. But that's separate from your big lifts. Uh, so you just have to define this stuff and write it down so you can make sure you're getting better at all of this stuff all the time. You got to be getting better at something all the time. Mark, what is the nerd math approach to run longer? I can run 10K, but I'd love to double it. Didn't I answer this question last week? I feel like I answered this exact question last week. Um, run longer. Uh, you just have to run more. I mean, there's a whole nerd math progression to that, but there's like 87 ways to do that. You, you're running 10K, what's 10K? Uh, 5K is what, 3.2 miles, 10K is 6.4 miles, am I right? Am I right on that? And you wanna get to a half marathon, you have to double that. Um, you have to start pumping up your volume and your pacing. There's a billion ways to answer that question for running. Uh, you could start by taking your 10K time and adding one minute to the run every section of that time and then compare it to your time to make sure you're keeping pace um, and start building up towards your half marathon, which is what, 13.1? Is it 13.1? 13.1 miles. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little over double of the 10K, right? I don't, oh, I get confused on these ones. Um, you have to build that up. You have to start adding a little bit of time every day and then you need to be doing speed work two other days. So start taking your 10K time twice a week probably and adding a minute to it each time and then have two days of speed work a week and then probably two days <coughs> of uh, long kettlebelling. There's a couple of ways you could do that long kettlebelling idea. You could just do swings um, and do a swing program where you kept adding sets to it, volume cycles, until you get up to the amount of time of your projected half marathon, which is a lot, it's a lot of sets. Um, and you could then 
uh, build up to either like a half marathon kettlebelling or a, or a full marathon kettlebelling because a full marathon kettlebelling is really a half marathon running time wise. Uh, and those would be two other days a week. There's a bunch of ways you can do that, but it's all based on the skills that you already possess and how strong you are. But think long running twice a week, speed work twice a week, uh, hamstring core work twice a week, six day a week program pretty easily, but that could vary so much. You could also have two days of cycling uh, as cross training. You could have two days of sled as cross training. So way too many factors there to answer that question effectively with the amount of information I have. Um, how can one safely push the weight upwards with the strong and fit two-handed mill squat program? Been slowly working upwards, but heavy light cycles I added in, but I want to go heavy for a bit and push it. Then go heavy for a bit and push it. Uh, you'll take your numbers from your previous max weight, multiply it by your number of reps. That'll give you a work capacity that you're looking for for each set of, say, squats uh, for your four rounds. Um, and then divide it by the new weight to get a projected number of reps that you are looking for in that amount of time. Um, if you have already done that program through three or four times with three or four different weights, then you're probably good enough at the program in order to try a heavier weight jump. Um, probably don't go above 50 if you're under three years of club training though. Uh, getting above that can really mess you up if you lose control for anything that's a shield cast or a mill pattern. Um, yeah, don't, don't rip your spine out. But take your previous work capacity, your previous reps times the weight, multiply it, get that number, then divide it, divide it by the new way to give you a new projected number of reps that you are looking for. And then you're probably gonna be at 80% of that number because your body's just not gonna be used to the load. And then you start to build up towards that work capacity. That's the general idea anyway. But I would not make the jump um, unless You've already done it like four or five times through. So you're very, very good and you know exactly where you need to go. If you try to make big jumps in weight, but your form is not correct, then you are going to get thrashed because the big weights are unforgiving. It's not like trying to bench. It's torque and it's traction on all of your joint structures. So if your form is not good and then you go up in weight, you are going to mess up some tendon or ligament somewhere and put yourself down. But that's up to you. You have to decide how good you are by honest self-coaching, honest Honest, you have to deal with yourself honestly. Film yourself. Are your arms locked out on the inside pendulum and the outside pendulum at the bottom? Is your spine actually facing the club? If it is not, do not try that. You will thrash yourself and put yourself in physical therapy. Hi from the Philippines. There we go, hello Philippines. Good afternoon from Hickory, North Carolina. North Carolina, I gotta ride my dirt bike down there. 4 a.m. in New Zealand. Wow, this guy's on hardcore time. I love the concept of base human movements. That's all we try to do is base human movements. Everybody else does sports specific stuff. The problem is when people get super into football or they get super into gymnastics or something, they might lose base human movements in their quest to be super good at something above base human movements. Um, you kind of see this with ballerinas all the time. Ballerinas are notoriously klutzy. Um, and it's not because they're klutzy, it's because they've trained their foot to do a specific thing as they walk across the floor because it's very pretty. And then when they try to speed that up and they run across the driveway covered in stones, they try to do that toe thing with their foot because that's what they've been trained to do. And then they drag their toe and they fall on their face. And everybody goes, oh, ballerinas are klutzy. It's not that they're klutzy, it's that they're hyper adapted to the sport that they do or the activity that they do. And that activity is not designed for the real world. It's designed for the stage so that they look super cool on stage. It's not designed to look super cool in a stone lot. There are base human movement patterns that I think 
exist, and I'm pretty sure we can talk about them all day long. There's base running movement patterns, there's base quadruped movement patterns, there are base um, jumping movement patterns, and but all of that should be based on leverage. The thing that separates us from everything else on the planet is our ability to use tools because we have a thumb. Um, so something like bench pressing does not really work on base human movement patterns. It's an ad adaptation to something that doesn't exist in the real world. Barbells, as cool and as awesome as they are, are not like a bag of grain. They're not like a bale of hay. They're not like a rafter that you're lifting up to put on top of a house so you can put a roof on. They are a perfectly symmetrical object that's equally balanced, which I, I do not know where that exists in the real world. If you go into the bat country and you start splitting wood, picking up logs is nothing like picking up a barbell. Picking up a barbell allows you to get really, really strong in flat lines. The problem is when you start putting that on a slope three feet deep in snow with an object with a non-symmetrical center of gravity. Um, it's awesome, I love barbells, um, but we have to go back and start working on those base human movement patterns because that's what the body's designed to do. If people are in pain, then let's restore natural human movement first and then build out to our sport from there. Everybody tries to skip the basic part of training and everybody tries to jump to sport specific training and neglects base human training. Um, yeah, I think basic human movement training, picking up heavy objects that are round or don't have handles on them, uh, like sandbag lifting is absolutely incredible. Slam ball lifting is absolutely incredible. It's very close to something like lifting in the real world. Um, obviously, um, maces and clubs are super close to real world, but they're controllable. They're not pure chaos. So we have to stay out of the realm of pure chaos. We have to make it controllable enough then we can replicate it and make sure we're getting better at the basics. And we have to do that because none of us are Tarzan. None of us grew up in the forest doing absolutely basic human movement skills from the time we were born on. We're all in an artificial world of our creation called civilization where we sit in cars and we put groceries in cars and we don't carry things and we don't chop down trees every day and we don't build fires every day. So we're missing a lot of those base human movement patterns because we simply don't do them anymore. So we need to find a bridge between pure human movement and controllable, repeatable training so that we can get better at the thing in the middle. That's what I'm always trying to talk about is the thing in the middle. Uh, Evan Crenshaw, is it worth getting an 8X club if I already have a full set of standard clubs? Sure, if you want the weights that don't exist, absolutely. If you want to go up to single arm 40 and you go, you have a 15, 20, 25, a 35, and a 45, if you want to get up to single arm 45, then it would very much, very much help to have a 27.5, a 30, a 32.5, a 37.5 in order to get up to single arm 40 or, uh, yeah, single arm 45. Um, you don't have to. You can do whatever you want. Do I think it's worth it? Yes, I absolutely think that having all the weights in the middle helps um, because 10 pound jump is not a 10 pound jump in clubs because they're a lever. The second that, loves, that club starts to rotate, that becomes much more than 10 pounds the further away from the center where your hand is that it gets. So if you can walk your way up, you are less likely to get hurt and you are more likely to have a good outcome. It's exactly like barbell training that way. In barbell training, you have little one or half kilogram weights that you can stack on there so that you can perfectly adjust in order to do it. There's not just a 200 pound barbell and a 300 fixed weight barbell at the gym. You can adjust it. Adjusting makes everything better. Do I love fixed weight clubs? Yes, I used them for years. I had them for 15 years before I got an ADEX. ADEX solves problems that people don't know that they're going to have. Um, and they don't, know that they, they don't know those problems are there until they try to go up in weight. Once you try to go up in weight, you want an ADEX. You want an adjustable weight club where you can control it so that you can have predictable outcomes. 
Absolutely, 100%. I think an 8X is worth it. I think it's worth it for everything. I think anything like that is a super good idea. I love adjustable kettlebells. Everybody's got fixed weight kettlebells. If you've been doing kettlebells for years, I have, I've spent, I don't know, $15,000 on kettlebells over the years. And it all could have been replaced by adjustable kettlebells. I wish I'd known about them and I wish that they had been available, but they weren't. Uh, but they do make your life better. Going from a 20 to a 21 to a 22 to a 23 to a 23 and a half allows you to do things you wouldn't otherwise be able to survive with an 8K jump between a 16 and a 24 or something like that. You absolutely will benefit from having more weights available to you, just like in the gym. In the gym, everything is adjustable by very small increments. There is a reason for that. Uh, let's go back up to the top here. Um, Zach Bracker. Thank you, sir, for the donation. Seth Gibson, any programs or specific exercises you would recommend for someone starting judo and jujitsu training? Yes, everything I do. Um, jujitsu, rotation, stepping pattern, pull something over your shoulder, 30 basic moves. It's all stepping, it's all lifting it ob objects. You need uh, kettlebells, single arm, clean and press, cross body stabilization, start working on it so you can stand all the way up and you can bend all the way forward. Hip snap, swing, your base hip snap, T step across, turn in, bounce your hip back, go over the shoulder, hip snap, 100%. Um, all of your club training, mill squat program, 100%, 100%. 100%. You need to be able to rotate equally well both directions. Um, all of mace. All the stuff I teach is specifically designed for martial arts. Pick any one of the programs and start doing it and you will instantly start to see your jujitsu, your jujitsu game go up. Everything I do is designed to restore those basic human movement patterns. Jujitsu is base human movement patterns. Um, so pick a program, go up. Uh, you need to make sure your neck works, your shoulders work, your spine works, spinal rock series, hip mobility series, because you're going to end up in jujitsu in horrible positions on the ground where you're going to be in cross leg locks and everything like that. Your hips need to work. If they don't work, you're not going to be able to get in and out of position. Um, all, of our, all of our body weight training coming up is all get-ups. What happens when you do judo? You throw, you hit the ground, you get up, you get thrown again. Back and forth, back and forth. Getting up is a skill that kills people. If you don't have it, then you're toast. You're absolutely toast. So, ivory get up program, Krav get ups, judo get up program, basic body weight 101 program, just learning to straighten out your hamstrings. If you have shit hamstring flexibility, you're not gonna like it. It's gonna go very poorly for you. Um, Mace 360s, yeah. Uh, there's a everything I talk about will make you better at judo and jujitsu on accident because they're base human skills. Um, someday when I get back to a real sprung floor where we could actually shoot it, we'll do the whole jujitsu basic rolling series that you need to do half kneeling, same side shoulder roll. If you can't do that, then you can't fall in judo. Um, you have to be really good at same side shoulder roll because that's what happens every time you get thrown and most of the throws, but they're all pretty much same side shoulder, shoulder rolls. I, just, I can't think of anyone that's not, but I haven't done judo in years. I'm just that much of a nerd um, to organize that information in a bunch of ways. You have to prioritize what's the most important part, not dying when you hit the ground and then getting up. On it has a 25 pound mace. Yes, they do. It is very heavy. Uh, you should do a lot of training before you try to use it, otherwise, you're going to thrash yourself. Uh, M. Raul Selick. How can I fix the lateral pelvic tilt and leg size and balance? Right calf circumference is 44, while left calf is 42. My right leg is also externally rotated. What kind of time frame is realistic for fixing? Uh, six months to a year, club training, inside circle, outside circle, shield cast, inside pendulum, outside pendulum, alternating circle, alternating pendulum. Lateral hip shift, 
You have to force yourself to leave center and come back to it over and over and over again. And you have to rotate that on each side. So your hip girdle has to rotate. So you can figure out if your length tension relationship is equal on all the muscles on both hips. If you rotate one way well, then those the length tension relationship on one hip is long. And if you don't rotate the other way, then that length tension relationship is off. You start with a light weight and you do all the basics. Um, and that will start to get your leg discrepancy better. Most people stand in one good leg. 50 to 60% of the load is in one good leg and they shift slightly away from it. So you have to swing a weight this way because it's gonna force your body to go back and forth with the center until it becomes efficient and finds center. Um, anything that swings weight laterally will help. I like the club because it's the most controllable and it's as you go up in weight, it's the least forgiving for being out of center. So you start with the movements, you work on the length tension relationship, you repeat the cycle, you go up in weight, it pulls you closer and closer to center. After you've done the cycle, you know, with five, six different weights, you should end up pretty close to in the center. And then there's a bunch of tricks after that to make sure that the calves are working equally. Um, but that's, that's like year two usually. Uh, Dimitros Mermimaridis. I'm saying that wrong. Dimitrios. Dimitrios. You've talked about doing 500 push-ups a day. What was your basic sets rep scheme? Out of curiosity, what is your max rep on push-ups? My max reps on push-ups is shit now because I don't do them anymore. Um, because doing 500 push-ups is super super boring and it takes forever. So I was doing push-ups because I had zero other information on what to do. Zero information. I grew up on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. It was pre-internet. There was no smartphones. The close, the only thing that I had was a Navy recruiter at the mall gave me a Bud's warning order. And it was a whole program, Bud's Basic Underwater Demolition School um, thing. And I started it when I was like 15, because I had nothing else to do. I worked outside. We had three channels. It was like NBC, Channel 44 Christian Station, where we watched like Rin Tin Tin from black and white TV shows and old cowboy westerns. No, that was it. We only had two stations. And we had one radio station. I would say it was a low information time was pretty accurate. Although I did read like 5,000 novels during that time of my life, whereas, which is where I got most of my information. Um, uh, I was doing 500 push-ups and you built up to that. Um, but it was, what was it? It was 20 sets of 25. So you would do 25 push-ups, 25 sit-ups, and then a set of pull-ups, and then repeat it 20 times through. And you put a bunch of pennies on the floor and you would start with 20 pennies and every time you would finish the pull-ups you would drop down and you would slide a penny over and they do the same thing now with uh, poker chips in crossfit gyms where they count sets by sliding over poker chips um, and you just did that and i did that five days a week for i don't know five six years um almost all the way through high school um, and then into college uh, cause I didn't know how to use any gym equipment. Nobody ever taught me any of that stuff. Um, when I went to university of Southern California, I went to the gym and I eventually, I think year two or three really started doing a lot of gym stuff. You know, you bought men's health magazines and you did the workout in there cause that's the information you had. Um, and you had friends who were kinesiology majors and then they, they helped you out with stuff as well. Uh, none of that was super good training, by the way. Uh, the problem with the pushups is, is that um, my chest was super strong. I mean, my chest was massive. Uh, you'll see pictures from me back then. A, I had long, beautiful flowing hair, uh, but my chest was crazy big. Um, and my arms weren't that big because I wasn't swinging any levers. Um, and tons of pull-ups and sit-ups. You know what's left out of that equation? Low back and glutes. Uh, nobody told me that that was important. And I used to have, my, my abs got so strong that they would pull my spine kind of out of alignment. And I wouldn't be able to walk for a week because uh, my abs would contract and they would just pull my back out of alignment because my back wasn't equally as strong. 
And that was a huge problem for years for me, and I didn't understand what the problem was. I was doing everything I thought I was supposed to do, and I looked really good, but I was actually extraordinarily weak because the structural integration was not there, was not there. Um, and so I started doing a bunch of like old school Kung Fu training where you picked up stuff and like weird tiger grip stuff. Cause once again, that's the information I had when I went out to USC, I met a guy like at the library and he recognized the way I walked as somebody who did martial arts. Cause martial arts, people can pick each other out the same way ballerinas can pick each other out. And he said, Hey, you should come to my school. And I went to the school and it was in K town, Koreatown. Uh, underneath the Buddhist temple on 3rd Street. Um, and we did old school like Kung training where we would do like staff and then we would do like jars, but they weren't jars anymore. They were really like bricks that you would pick up. Uh, but I still wasn't very strong, but I got way stronger um, from doing the stance work. My thighs got like four inches bigger, it was nuts. Um, but I still had trouble because my lower back was still weaker than than my glutes and my shoulders um, and it wasn't until i discovered kettlebelling because i was looking for old types called stone padlock training for uh, kung fu um, i was trying to find information on that you can get that now but you couldn't get it back then um, and i discovered kettlebells and of course i thought i was super hardcore so i bought a 24k kettlebell and i tried to lift it and instantly realized I was not strong at all. Um, and I got a 12K and I started at a 12K and then I went through 12K and I had a limited amount of money. So I had a 12K and a 24K for like three years and that was it. Um, and I built up and I did my RKC and survived it and everything. But push-ups got shoved out because uh, push-ups made you really good at doing push-ups, but it didn't translate to swinging levers. It didn't make you turn faster. It didn't really make me hit harder. It took a lot of time every day, 20 sets of 25 push-ups, sit-ups. And then I think I was doing built into that was like, you know, sets of five or 10 pull-ups. It was a hundred or 200 pull-ups a day. I don't remember. Um, but there was no structural core integration in the whole idea. Um, so while it looked really cool, I really would have benefited from somebody telling me to pick up sandbags the way I had done on the farm. But the way I'd done it on the farm, I was never strong because there was always a hole in the movement. Um, parts of my body were stronger than the other parts of my body. Um, yeah. So that's how I did it. I used to do 20 sets of 25 for 500 push-ups. It's not super fun. It takes forever. Uh, I eventually, I added weight vests to it and was doing weight vests with the whole idea. Um, yeah, it, it took a long time. It took a long time every day and it was not entertaining. Now I would say uh, do dips, do dips and pull-ups instead. And then core strength all comes from kettlebells and comes from club swinging. That's where your pain-free integrated movement comes from is making sure those things work. The length tension relationship in your hips, your spine and your core works great. Then if you, I just did dips right before this live because uh, it was fun. I'm doing them just for entertainment. Um, but if you, something better than push-ups would be kettlebell long cycle. All the time you spend on push-ups, put it into kettlebell long cycle, double long cycle, and you will be way, way better off. If you could do 500 reps of kettlebell long cycle, or even just any 10 minute set, competition set of double long cycle, I think would be substantially better use of your time than push-ups. I like push-ups and they're fun to do sometimes. I do them when I go to CrossFit or when I go to somebody's martial arts gym and that's what they have in there. But for the most part, you should focus on other things if you can. Unless you're locked in a cell and it's a prison workout or something, then there are other things that are more beneficial than push-ups. Dips are more beneficial than push-ups. Clean and press has better structural integration, double long cycle, is what I think everybody should be moving towards because you're picking something up, it's all core load, and you're doing double overhead lockout. And if you start doing it for time, then you build up to longer and longer periods of time, you'll get a lot of the same benefits that you would get from doing push-ups. you'll just get them better. Uh, R. Madden, do I have any recommendation on watches? Nothing crazy 
or expensive. Um, something that measures heart rate. Something that doesn't measure heart rate. Uh, Citizen Eco Drive Dive Watch. Um, this is my second one. I lost the first one on the side of a mountain. And when I wrecked a dirt bike on the side of a mountain, back country, all alone, not a great idea. Went off a cliff, had, I don't know if you can still see them, one, two, three. I had three branches go through my arm and I had to pull them out and then I wrapped up my arm and then I had to drag my bike. Fireman deadlift, drag a 400 pound DRZ or 350 DRZ up an incline in soft sand. Not great, but excellent use of your fitness. Good time to work on that fitness. And then I couldn't get the bike started because I'd ripped off the clutch cable and then I started pushing it back through the mountains and I eventually figured out that I could, I messed with the bike. I got down to the base of the cable and got it into first and rode back four or five miles. So I lost the first one of these during that. When I got back, I had chunks of meat hanging out of my arm and I had wrapped it all up and I was like, where the hell is my watch? Lost it when I went down that hillside. Um, this watch is great. It's not super expensive. I think I saw them on sale last year for $250, but this is like a lifetime watch. I got this recommendation from a guy I know who is a pirate hunter. That's a real job. Um, pirate hunter who was, there's like a special forces tier one group of the Coast Guard and they protect ships, ships that have been taken over by pirates and they fly around the world and they go in at night on Zodiacs and then it takes them like four hours to board the boat because these giant containers are about 60 to 70 feet. The deck is above waterline. So that's a six or seven story building. And they use these big air cannons and they shoot them up and they grapple over it. And that boat is the size of like eight football fields or whatever. And then they climb with all of their gear in the swaying ocean at night, wearing night vision up to the top. And then they get and they hold position at the top. And then when they get all the guys up there, then they take over. I asked the sick guy the same question, what watch should I get? And he held up his wrist and he said, I've had one of these things on my wrist for the last 25 years. Um, eco drive means that they use solar power. There's a capacitor inside instead of a battery. And so if you wear them, then they run forever. They never need batteries or anything like that. Um, and it's just plain old watch, watch, dial watch, hardcore, doesn't break. Um, not that I know anyway. Um, if you want something that tracks heart rate, uh, I was wearing a Garmin Instinct, but uh, it wasn't the solar one. I had the generation before the solar one and it just really gets annoying to charge it all the time. Um, and I find that a lot of those things that track heart rate don't track kettlebell heart rate, which is super duper, duper annoying. You will do a kettlebell set and it will tell you your heart rate's at resting because it can't keep up with the variability of the heart rate or something. There's supposed to be some way you can get a chest band that links to it through Bluetooth, but then every time you're doing a long set, if you catch in the same way, you're probably gonna push it off, but then you gotta wear a shirt that's got a special band in it. I don't know, I, I would love to see one of the new Garmin Instinct Solars. Um, I don't know, man. It's kind, of, it's kind of complexity that I always play with. Every couple of years, I get a heart rate watch, and I play with it for a while just to see if it's tracking your calories. But because it doesn't track my heart rate during things like kettlebells or clubs, uh, it'll track if you go for a walk. I think the GPS in them, once you start moving, starts to say, hey, check heart rate. But even if you put it on exercise and you stand in one place and you do something like mills for 30 minutes, your heart rate is definitely elevated, you're dripping sweat. It still says you're at rest, I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm just fully misunderstanding how to use that watch. Um, but that drove me nuts and I stopped wearing it because I hated the fact that it was not tracking heart rate like that. Uh, so, Citizen EcoDrive. Divers 200 meter watch is my favorite go-to watch. And I think I'll probably have this watch the rest of my life. All the other ones, they come and they go. Um, Jeff Walker, you're gonna have to define this for me. Question from 1221. Oh man, that's, that's a long time ago. He might not be here anymore. Uh, 
when kettlebelling, what are your thoughts on ATP, PC system of energy use? Apologize if I already asked. Um, I don't remember this question. Um, adenosine triphosphate um, use of energy systems. So what that question is, is how energy comes into and out of cells. Um, I don't know the pure science on this because I'm not sure if anybody outside of the Eastern Bloc has done pure science on this. Uh, the diff there's a big difference between like Western training and origin. Um, see you later. Um, in energy system. So in the West, we have like lift, do cardio, right? And we kind of like standard training is three sets of five or Olympic lifting, do cardio. And it's a pretty good strategy. It works pretty well, but it's not quite the same as something like kettlebell training. I really honestly don't know what the energy systems are that kettlebells are doing inside at a cellular level. I just know it changes people in a way that nothing else does. Uh, heavy club swinging is the next closest thing energy system wise, but the way, but because clubs are lighter, they don't have that same effect as something like double long cycle. Double long cycle changes people on a cellular level on the way that they use energy. It's crazy. I don't know if anything in gym training that does anything like this, not even close. The closest you can get to uh, some similar type of cardio adaptation, I think, is mountain climbing, like on a Versa climber, uh, because it's total body load all the time. But kettlebelling, because you're holding in load, your body is learning to adapt to recovering while still under load. Most people do pure strength training and they pick up a weight one to five times and then they set it down for two to three minutes and their body recovers during that. Kettlebells are different. You pick up the weight and you hold on to it for three minutes to 10 minutes and then your body changes inside at a cellular level to change your ability to hold that weight. It recovers while doing stuff. Um, I think kettlebells are very, very unique in that way. And I think specifically moving towards eventing, I don't think that's the right word. Eventing is a word from equestrian arts. Um, but it's like eventing, you know, uh, jerk, snatch, and long cycle, double long cycle. They change the way the body works on a cellular level. I would love to see an in-depth analysis and study of that and the pure science of how the cells are using energy, but I don't have a good answer for that. I know that it works. I don't know the energy system mechanism by which it works. Um, do I have any videos on spinal rocks? Uh, Tesla bot official. Do I? I don't know. I should. Do I not? I know it's in tons of my programs. I don't know if I've made a video about it. Is it in our body weight playlist? I'll have to go back and look. I've made like 800 videos. It's it very hard to keep track. Single arm 45 pound club is a beast. Yes, it is. It takes a long time to get there. It takes an even longer time to do it without ripping your arm out of the socket or killing yourself. Um, Lobaka. I used to know somebody named Lobaka. I switched light kettlebell swings to Romanian deadlifts and heavy swings against power cleans. Am I missing anything? No. You're just going to do a different type of training for a while. That's totally fine. Light kettlebell swings tend to have more time under tension. You do more of it. When you go to heavy, you do less time under tension. Life is long. You're gonna do both eventually anyway. So if you wanna to jump to some other type of training, jump, jump to some other type of training. Uh, you'll come back. Eventually, we all come back to endurance weightlifting. You work on strength and power a lot, but you do that with almost everything. But life is really an endurance game. And if you want to keep, if you do kettlebelling long enough, you'll come back to the endurance stuff because it's one thing to be able to clean and press a 40K three times. It's another thing to long cycle double 24s for 10 minutes. Which one's better? I think the endurance one is better, but it took me 15 years to get to that conclusion. 
um, because we all wanted short-term benefit faster, which is what the pure strength ideas do. So you can go from intermediate weight, long time, to super heavy weight, focus on pure power. You can do it by season. Excellent, keep training. As long as you're jumping programs and jumping cycles, you'll never get bored. Um, try to whoop strap with an armband. Still couldn't get heart rate accurate on kettlebells and clubs. Me too. I tried the whoop. Couldn't get a thing to track on kettlebells and clubs. Drove me bonkers. I took it off and I put it in a bag. I wore it for three months and I could not get the damn thing to track kettlebell heart rate at all. Take your heart rate, compare it to the whoop. The whoop is off. It was off massively, massively off. Um, I don't know why none of the things seem to track the heart rate well. I really wanted the whoop to work because it has no buckle back here, so you can still wear it as intended on the wrist, and you can get it out of the way so that there's nothing back here for the kettlebell to land on, so it's not beating the shit out of you and destroying your wrist. Um, but I couldn't get the whoop to do it work either. It works pretty well for something like mace flow. I think, once again, because you're moving, there's something about the, maybe there's an accelerometer in there or something that's tracking the movement, but just standing doing stuff, it tends not to track at all. T, uh, this question, if you could choose just one exercise movement to do for the rest of your life, what would it be? Mills, Mills. Um, what is your advice on shoulder impingement? Bought your mobility video to start helping as you have a desk job and definitely to do mobility work. Uh, yeah, everybody's got shoulder impingement, people who live in the modern world because their body doesn't work right. Um, I think you start with your mobility and then you start added loaded rotation into it. All the club stuff, all the May stuff. If you start light enough and you stay at a lightweight long enough, you'll probably solve it. I say 95% chance you'll solve it. Uh, one out of 20 people has some type of super serious injury in there that they just don't know about or they're ignoring or they're trying to ignore by doing a bunch of other stuff because they didn't do the mobility work in the beginning and they ended up thrashing themselves. And some those people probably have to go to some type of therapy because they probably have locked up tightness somewhere, either in the front, in the pec, underneath their collarbone, it could be in the back, in the scap. Um, Usually one out of 20 people will need to get further work, but usually 19 out of 20 can just solve it. Shoulder impingement, impingement, not super severe, by doing, restoring basic human movement. Any advice on how to prevent stiff, stiff neck after a slam ball program? Do your neck mobility after your slam ball program. If you're getting neck tightness after slam ball, that means that your head is not in the correct starting position while you're doing this. You might have a jutted forward head and you're creating too much tension in your upper trap area and you need to focus on drawing your chin back. One of the old things you used to see boxers do was to put a tennis ball under their chin so that they would learn to keep their head back while they were doing things instead of sticking their chin out. Um, there's a bunch of different ideas for that, but reinstitute your neck mobility and there's something wrong with your posture if just by doing basic human movement something is going wrong. So you might need to go see somebody like a physical therapist or a massage therapist or a body worker to figure out if something up there is permanently tight and it's causing things that shouldn't be tight to be tight. Uh, re solution for almost everybody, everybody in the world's health would get better if they did massage therapy. People who live in the modern world, we sit down too much, we sit at desk too much, we look at our phone too much. We all have compromised posture, everybody. And if you start trying to restore human movement, but that tent, that uh, tissue is permanently thickened already, then it, you might have to find some way to release it. An easy way to do it is to go to a massage therapist, let them look for it, and they drag all this stuff along there and they break up the adhesions in the muscle fiber so that you can actually return to a neutral head position when you're doing your different types of lifting. That might be something you have to do. I did it for 10 years. I did muscular therapy for 10 years after I ripped my leg in half. I started with twice a week for like three or four years uh, because my body was so messed up 
and I did all of my club swinging and everything else, which is the reason it got better because what they had given me at physical therapy would not have worked. Did not work at all. Absolutely didn't work. But then I did go to body work, which is super advanced, crazy massage stuff for years afterwards. Um, and anytime I'm back in LA, I still go to the same lady, uh, Tara Scott. Uh, she's an absolute mad genius when it comes to that stuff. And she will find it and crush it and you'll release and become better instantaneously. What is better for developing strength for martial arts and life in general? Double kettlebells or single kettlebells above 32? Even cross shaw. Uh, both. Um, but if you want to say which one is better, it's a single. Single. Cross body stabilization. Um, if you want even better than that, it would be single kettlebell and club. You need rotation power. <laughs> You need to rotate equally well both sides. Um, I usually say single kettlebell first, then two-handed club, then single hand club, then mace, then double kettlebell. I put double kettlebell further down on the list because it's way harder on most people and it's essentially recreating barbell, but it doesn't emphasize the things that you really need to do, like throwing patterns. If you're in martial arts, throwing a punch. It's called throwing a punch, throwing a kick. Throwing patterns need to be built up. Single kettlebell, cross body stabilization, because every move that you do in martial arts is some type of cross body load. Um, and then club, throwing pattern, throwing pattern, throwing pattern, throwing pattern. Uh, Justin Levine says he has an Apple watch and his heart rate goes through the roof when he's kettlebelling. Yeah, kettlebelling is psycho on the heart. Um, I would love to, maybe I'll try an Apple watch. I just, you know, economy's down. I'm not sure how much more gear I can buy. I really need a new laptop because my laptop is not good for editing anymore. I've been trying to shoot in 4K and I simply do not have enough RAM to run 4K. Um, so it takes me much longer to, to edit right now. It takes me forever to export. And then I don't even think I'm getting 4K when I upload anyway because of my upload speeds. I think it's downgrading my quality content anyway. Like two of the videos I uploaded this week did not look like they did on my computer when I watched them on my phone later. They looked like they had been downgraded in quality massively. So I have to balance. What do I buy? A new laptop or an Apple Watch? It's going to be laptop. Uh, I would love to have an Apple Watch because I would love to try it out um, to see if it's better than everything else. Um, if I could get a watch that actually tracked heart rate properly, I would love it. I've just kind of gave up hope after the Garmin Instinct didn't track shit and then after the Whoop didn't track shit. Um, Banicus, Ban E Kiss. Ban Banikis, 18. Uh, the entire right side of his body is currently out of whack due to previous nerve damage from MS, multiple, scleros multiple sclerosis. My lisp is coming through. I'm doing a two-hand club program. Can I do an ABC program with strong fit clubs and one-hand club? Yes. Two-hand club twice a week, one-hand club twice a week, single arm kettlebell twice a week. Always do your bad side first. Always do your bad side first uh, and then match it. When the bad side breaks down, stop. Match it with the right side and then you're done. But yeah, nerve damage, terrible. Restore movement patterns, 100% all we can do. That's what we can do for everything. Restore movement patterns, restore movement patterns and then keep restoring them forever. Every day, your movement patterns try to get worse. That is the process of aging. It's a loss of complexity, and your body tries to adapt to the modern world, uh, which means sitting down and looking at phones for 90% of people. Um, so every day we're fighting the fight of trying to get movement patterns back and keeping them back by doing them. Any more than five days off and your movement patterns are gonna crash through the floor. You will remember the base, but you have to refine them forever. It should be a daily life practice forever. If you have nerve damage or something, you don't really get those five days off. You probably get two days off at max. 
um, because you're going to have to keep it up. Even if you were to cut weight for really light days, you can cut weight for five days, but you have to keep moving. Apple Watch has a walled garden ecosystem, but wearing it really tight on the inside of the wrist will track kettlebell heart rate pretty good when set to high intensity interval training. Thank you, Christian Fiade. Um, I'd love to try one. I just got to get one. There's no Apple stores around here. I think the nearest Apple store, I think there's like two in this entire state. Um, yeah, there's no just Apple stores you go into. I'm used to Los Angeles where I could just walk two miles and walk into an Apple store. Uh, I wanted to go look at new laptops and I was like, oh my God, the nearest place is like 120 miles away and a gas at 650 a gallon here. I was like, nah, I don't know about that. Well, maybe we'll just stay here for now and keep wearing my normal watch and just letting my heart rate do whatever the hell it wants. Uh, let's talk about that really quick with kettlebells in relation to heart rate. Cause I was thinking about this earlier today, um, because you can control pace in kettlebelling it has this crazy effect because you can hold on to weight for x period of time but you can also set the metronome uh, for different metronome speeds per minute um, which causes you to breathe at different rates because you breathe in time with the movement so if you are setting for one rep every six seconds 10 reps per minute your breathing pattern is different than if you set for 15 reps per minute um, and then your breathing and your structure and your movement are all linked, which is the goal, which is how we create endurance. Kettlebells do that differently than everything else, but you are under load the entire time. So by changing the pace at which you move every day, you change your breathing, but you stay under load. This has like an infinitely good effect on the heart because your heart has to keep up with that load which is what's really different about kettlebelling is the endurance weightlifting aspect of it. You get the same thing from clubs, but double 24K, 48K is very different, which would be 106 pounds, which is very different from even a super heavy club at 50 pounds. If you're gonna be doing 10 minute sets, probably not gonna be using a 50 pound club. That's bonkers heavy. Um, you'll probably be down in the 30 pound range. So that it's a pretty vast difference structurally between the torque and torsion of a 30 pound club for 10 minutes and a and 48K of load for 10 minutes. They're just very different, uh, but they're the same thing. But I think they do, I would love to see more research on what's actually happening in the energy systems of the body because nothing else does it. When I started kettlebelling, my life got instantly better. I ran faster, I hit harder, I did martial arts way, way better. Um, uh, than I ever did. Uh, your video is chunking a bit. I'm sorry guys, I can't help that. Uh, this is the signal we have where we're at. Are there good adjustable club systems other than ADEX? Uh, I don't know if a single one. Um, I, there are a lot of other systems. There's like, uh, what's the rock bar, which is really like a barbell with a screw top on it, but it's really just for doing Mace 360s. Um, I don't know what else you would do with that because you put on big normal steel plates with it. If you tried to pass past your shins, you, if you hit yourself, you definitely shatter your leg. Um, there's the Paul of Valdo from Europe. I have one. Um, cool, very cool, love the shape of it, but it would do way better if it had an interior spline and it had weights that went on inside of it. Um, so you can adjust it, you can fill it with anything, sand or whatever, but that's, once again, if you're filling it randomly, you're gonna get random outcomes. Um, I don't know of a club system other than ADEX that does what we want it to do with those 1.25 pound jumps in weight, which is really what you're looking for. Um, I, somebody was messaging me about that. Uh, there was an engineer, I can't remember, uh, I haven't heard from him in a couple months, and he was talking about building a club system out of this new space tech material. If you're listening to this, message me. I want to know what's going on with that club system, that weird space tech material you were talking about. Uh, super, super strong, but we could beat the crap out of it without it shattering. Um, how do you keep motivated to keep exercising? I can't stop being lazy and eating crap. Uh, set adventures for yourself. Um, 
If you have nothing to look forward to, there's no reason to, reason to keep training. There's also no reason to keep living. Um, you have to find adventure in everyday life. Uh, just last weekend, um, I am doing a series of adventures here where I'm at because I don't have anything big and cool to do. So what I did last Friday night was I got on my uh, new enduro bike and there's train tracks that run all over Ohio and they run through every small town. And you kind of know where they go, but you don't really know where they go. So I just started at the train track right here by where I'm at. And I started crossing it back and forth all the way till I got to the next town. And then I got through the town and then I crossed the track all the way to the next town and then the next town and then the next town. Um, you have to find reasons to want to do things. Um, I love things like horseback riding and I really love enduro motorcycle riding. I am not good at it. I am terrible at it because I was super poor growing up. We didn't have the money to do any of that kind of stuff. So I got into it later in life. But I can go out and enduro ride with really good riders. They're way better riders than me, but they frag out. They get super tired very fast. Um, we go out to Gorman in California, which is north of LA, and we ride. And my buddy, great rider, can't ride for very long. He gets so tired. His legs get tired, he's sore, his back hurts, his shoulders hurt. You'd think he'd been hit by a car. I ride all day and I get tired. I go to bed, but I wake up, I feel nothing. The point is, is you want to build up your body so you can do things with your life. Go climb a mountain, ride a bicycle to the next town, um, ride a bicycle around your state. Riding a bicycle around any state is really, really, really far. And then get a gazetteer, which is, an, which is a grid by grid atlas of each individual state. So it's a whole book of breakdowns of hyper-focused in stuff of each state. Go to every state. Go to every small town in your state, look up the history of it, figure out who was there, when it was founded, what the population was, what it was doing. Learn, build adventure into your life. That's why you keep training. Um, or join something like martial arts, something that is infinite. Martial arts are infinite. You will never get done learning jujitsu. You can go do BJJ for 10 years and get a black belt. And then you keep doing it. Then you go to judo. And then you go to whatever that weird Beijing wrestling is. You just keep going. You have to find things. You have to find places to go and people to talk to in order to keep doing things forever. That is the point of life. If there's no other point to life, it is to go new places, to learn new things, to meet new people, and just keep going. And you just keep going forever. Um, it, once you start doing those things, you will want to eat better. If you're not doing anything but sitting down, then you will want to eat junk. And if you're like, wow, I have to go to jujitsu, and that guy's going to beat the crap out of me in my five-minute roll. I'm not going to eat these Cheetos. I'm going to eat a big bowl of vegetables because I feel better when that guy's choking me out for that brief period. You're like, ah, he's choking me out. But I'm really glad I ate that bowl of vegetables. I feel thinner. I feel light. I feel cleaner inside. The sweat coming out of my skin doesn't feel gross, um, which is what happens when you eat junk food. Um, you have to make reasons to do things. You have to make reasons to be healthy and you have to find things that are infinite. Adventure is infinite. There is no, even though the entire world has been found, found, um, ride a bike to the next town. If it's 10 miles away, go ride a bike there, ride back, pick another town, ride there, ride back. Ride, do, do something, ride a motorcycle someplace you've never gone. Stop picking stuff 3,000 miles away and putting your adventures far in the future and start picking adventures today, today, and go do them today. Wake up, work out, do your job, find an adventure to do and go do it. Uh, Frank, you haven't seen a gazetteer in a long time. Uh, you gotta buy them online now. Uh, get, them on, get them on Amazon. I just got my Ohio Gazetteer and I'm going through and I'm marking the places that I've been uh, because that's how nerdy I am. I am looking for places to go. I'm, right now I'm trying to find all the train stations. Uh, something I would really, really like to do. Uh, my dirt bike is loud and it's kind of illegal to be on the train tracks. So I want to get an electric mountain bike and go right down the train tracks. Uh, and go the way that everybody used to see your state. The whole world used to be seen by railroad. And you can still see it that way in a lot of parts of Europe and definitely in the UK. 
Um, but nobody does that here. They haven't had passenger trains around Ohio in, I don't know, 70 years or something. Sometime after World War II and before the 70s, they stopped. But they used to go to every small town, and every small town has an old train station in it, a one-room train station. Go find it. Fun. I don't know. There's a billion things you can do. Um, we just have to start actively trying to find things that are economical to do, and then doing them. Keanu Reeves, Keeves, Rianu Keeves. There you go. Uh, I was doing kettlebells and his wrist failed. Um, your wrist, you need to catch in the correct position. You probably catch, caught in the wrong position because you were trying a heavier weight and then you need to do wrist strength. That means kettlebells, clubs, and mace. Do your clubs and your mace. Uh, drop down, do light mace for a long time. Uh, yes, I did live in other countries besides the U.S. I used to live in London for two years. I lived in Glasgow, Scotland in a castle for quite some time. I lived in Romania. I've lived, lived around. Uh, do I follow a specific diet myself? Uh, yes, I do intermittent fasting. Um, I would like to say I do 16, 8, 16 hours of not eating, 8 hours of eating, but that tends to fall apart. When I'm in the Midwest, um, it ends up being more like 13, 11 maybe, um, because you end up eating, try to be done eating by 9 p.m., which is late. It should really be 8, um, and I really shouldn't start eating again until like maybe 2 the next day, I think, or noon, uh, noon 2, noon 2. Uh, but I don't, I don't eat in the morning anymore. Um, and then when I try to have first meal, I try to have first meal be three servings of vegetables and meat. Um, so I'm on like a veggie meat base diet because when you travel and you do things and you go out to see friends, you're going to end up eating something with a ton of carbs in it anyway. So I try to limit my food, not limit my food. I love my vegetables and meat, like creepy love it. Um, and I should probably do some videos on like what that is and how that works out. Um, but it's not like a specific name diet. It's like base human food. And then we try to keep it close to the paleo idea, uh, but that doesn't hold out very well. Um, with economic troubles coming, I imagine eating paleo is gonna get less realistic because rice and beans are cheap and uh, we'll probably go back to eating a lot of rice and beans, but Mexican food, awesome. Tomatoes, like there's a reason Mexican food is awesome. Um, and it uses a bunch of awesome, cheap, available things. Uh, when ADEX comes out with a super fat handle, want to get into mace or arc lengths, would arc be better given only eight foot ceilings to be adding weight to the ADEX mace? Gets really long. Yeah, if you have low ceilings, then yeah, use the arc for sure. Um, if you have low ceilings in your place and you have to train inside, get the arc. Um, uh, there has been no course drop for overweight people. J.I. Oliver uh, hasn't been finished. It's on the list. I just, I, there's a lot of stuff to do and uh, just working it. Paul Selleck, thank you, sir. Your answer on motivation is the truth. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you want to be able to go out and you want to be able to do things. You have to find things to do and then make sure that you're ready to do them when they come around. Um, if you're planning a trip to the back country in three months, then start training. Start training for that back country trip now. If you're going to ride dirt bikes every weekend, train four, four days during the week. If you're going to ride dirt bikes Saturday, Sunday, take Friday off or whatever and uh, train four days a week so that you can enjoy the things that you do when you get the time to do them. There's no point in living your life and then not being in shape when you actually have the time to do stuff. Then you've just wasted time, um, which we all end up doing at some point in our life, but we would like to not waste time. We would like to get better over time at doing the things that we wanna do. And we'll all spend our whole life working on getting better at that.
Uh, everybody who's getting wrist pain when you're doing your kettlebell cleans, cross train, everybody. You all need to cross train or you need to check your form. Um, but most people need to cross train. Kettlebells, when you swing them, pull out on your joints. Traction, that weight is trying to rip your body in half. If you have weird things or you're holding your body in weird positions, then when you traction it or you compress it, of course it will hurt. The whole point of alignment is to put your bones in a line that they can be compressed in. There's a reason people punch with a flat fist and they don't punch like this, because you'll break your hand. The same thing is true of kettlebells and clubs. You have to have good alignment. And if you don't have good alignment and you're hurting yourself, go down and wait. Be honest with yourself and repeat it until you're in the right part. <clears throat> uh, Damien. Damaged his rotator cuff and groin muscle a few months back. Stopped playing soccer for the past few months. Was 6'1", 235 pounds round. Started working out with a 63-pound kettlebell. Lost a lot of fat, getting, getting more toned, but my weight is the same. Now the problem is my weight I gained from doing nothing converted from fat to muscle, and I weigh the same. I, is that a problem? Um, the weight is a hindrance on the field playing soccer. What do you recommend? Uh, I recommend you keep doing all your corrective training, your kettlebells and your clubs. I recommend you get back out and start playing. I recommend you go on like a 16-8 diet, uh, 16 hours of break, eight hours of eating. I recommend your first meal be only uh, vegetables and meat. Uh, your first several meals can be vegetables and meat for sure. You need to starve your body of the carbohydrates after your first workout, work out in the morning, starve your body of carbohydrates, let your body move to burning fat, feed it only vegetables and meat so that it optimizes burning fat, go play sports, and then save your normal food for after that. Oh. All right, guys, this is Ben Mark Wildman. I'm sorry we got to wrap this up right now. Uh, thank you very much. We'll do this again next week. And have a good day, all.